When people disappear, it's quite common that wild speculation fills in the blanks. These fanciful speculations present far more exciting arguments than anything logical, and usually take centre stage. With some research, it's quite simple to find logical explanations for many famous disappearances. Take Flight 19, for example. In 1945, five torpedo bombers set off on a routine training mission from Fort Lauderdale in Florida. Once they are way out above the ocean, they report their compasses malfunctioning before the flight's radio transmissions becomes weaker. They are never seen again. Don't get me wrong, it could be supernatural circumstances that caused the disappearances, but existing evidence points to the conclusion that the flight leader mistook their actual position for another training flight path originating from Miami, which happens to be where he had just transferred from. The islands below them could easily have been confused with the Florida Keys, so this looks like a very plausible explanation. And yet, many choose to believe that supernatural powers were at work instead. I feel that this situation shows that oftentimes many mysterious disappearances can be concluded as not so mysterious after all. Which is why, when I come across disappearances where the explanation that the victim simply vanished off the face of the earth is potentially the best explanation we have, I quickly find myself far down the rabbit hole. Today I'd like you to join me so we can ask the vital question. Where in the world did these people go? Christmas Eve night of 1945 in Fayetteville, West Virginia, the Sodder family was retiring for the night in readiness for Christmas Day. The Sodder household was a tight-knit Italian-American family headed by parents George and Jenny Sodder and their ten children, though on this particular night, nine of the ten children were staying at the house. Mr. and Mrs. Sodder slept on the ground floor along with four of their children, whilst the other five slept in the upstairs bedrooms. Sometime between midnight and 1am, the Sodders were awakened by a fire that had engulfed their home. George and Jenny made frantic efforts to rescue their children from the burning house, only narrowly escaping themselves. They managed to save the four children who were sleeping on the same floor as them. However, it quickly became apparent that the five children sleeping upstairs were unaccounted for. In desperation, George attempted to use a ladder to reach the second floor window but the ladder was mysteriously missing. The family reportedly then tried to use a water barrel nearby to douse the flames, but the water inexplicably failed to flow. The local fire department was only two and a half miles away, but quite confusingly, they failed to arrive quickly enough to have any real effect. Eventually, the fire department did arrive, but tragically, nobody was able to save the five children trapped upstairs, and the inferno only grew larger, finally consuming the house. This event was clearly horrific, but it doesn't seem mysterious or linked to any sort of disappearances. Well, that's exactly how it seemed to the local authorities at the time. That was until the flames were extinguished and a search for the remains of the five children was conducted. The search found no remains of any of the five children. In the event of an intense fire where a body is completely disintegrated, it can still be identified by non-combustible remains, such as teeth. Yet, the investigators found nothing. Not a single piece of evidence. Apart from the lack of human remains, it was also found that many of their belongings were mysteriously missing. It was thought that since the remains of the children were missing, then they must have escaped the inferno. However, as time went on, they never turned up. To this day, the whereabouts of the five Sodder children is still unknown. So what happened here? I mean, there must be some explanation as to how the fire started, and more importantly, where the children ended up. Remember how I said the fire department took a very long time to arrive at the scene and fight the fire, which could have been the main factor in the failure to rescue the trapped children? Well, subsequent investigations revealed that the department's telephone lines had been tampered with, preventing an immediate call for help. It was also found that witnesses reported seeing the children in the company of an unidentified man prior to the fire, leading to speculations of abduction or foul play. This was something the parents claimed they knew nothing about. Could the fire have been arson? If so, what was the motive? Why would somebody want to assassinate this seemingly average family on Christmas Eve? One lead which may have some credibility is that the Sodder family were very outspoken critics of Italian dictator Benito Mussolini, leading to speculation that the children might have been targeted in a form of retaliation. 
However, this theory lacks concrete evidence and should only be viewed as pure speculation. Regarding the accusations of arson, the lack of ransom demands or any contact with the family raises questions about the validity of this theory. Nobody ever claimed any responsibility for the attack, and there were never any strong links supporting this theory. A theory that sounds a bit more convincing is that this was part of an extensive and well thought out plan to remove the children from the family. Proponents of this scenario argue that the fire was a diversion to conceal the children's removal, possibly by someone familiar with the family. The evidence supporting this is that the fire occurred whilst everyone in the house was asleep, so a potential arsonist would have no issue sneaking around undetected. If it was an elaborate plan, that would explain the tampering of the telephone lines, since burning all possible evidence of a crime is a tried and tested method of concealing one's involvement in the event. This theory unfortunately also suffered from a lack of evidence and was disregarded by the court. The official explanation was that the fire was likely caused by faulty wiring and it was concluded that despite the lack of the children's remains and belongings, they likely perished in the fire. The Sodder family remained adamant that this conclusion was incorrect, and they went on to launch a few investigations themselves. However, these investigations failed to unearth anything substantial to the case. It seemed that the court's conclusion was the most likely explanation, and the case soon left the public eye. But as it turned out, this was not the end of the case. The Sodder family received an envelope with no return address in the late 1960s, containing a photograph of a young man. The sender claimed that the person in the photo was Louis Sodder, one of the children presumed to have died in the fire. The photograph, if genuine, suggests that Louis may have survived. Many members of the family firmly believe that the man in the photo did in fact depict an older Louis Sodder. However, some family members have stated that they aren't convinced that it's him, despite the family's hopes and beliefs. The photograph has not been conclusively proven to be of Louis, and the mystery of the Sodder family disappearance remains unsolved. On December 26, 1900, on a remote island in the Outer Hebrides of Scotland, the Aileen Moore Lighthouse stood as a solitary beacon against the harsh North Atlantic. The lighthouse was manned by three experienced keepers. James Duckett, the principal keeper, Thomas Marshall, the second assistant, and Donald MacArthur, the occasional keeper. This night, however, marked the beginning of a mysterious disappearance that has baffled investigators for over a century. The lighthouse keepers were due for a routine shift change, but when the relief boat arrived, the crew was met with an eerie silence. No response came to their signals or calls, and after several unsuccessful attempts to make contact, it became clear that something was amiss. A decision was made to send a relief boat ashore with Joseph Moore, an assistant keeper from a neighbouring island, and Captain Harvey. As Moore approached the lighthouse, he discovered that the entrance gate was unlocked. A sense of foreboding enveloped him. When he entered the lighthouse, he was met with an eerie stillness. Two of the three oilskinned coats were missing, and the kitchen door was wide open. Inside, Moore found an overturned chair near the kitchen table and a clock that had stopped working. There was no sign of the keepers. The beds were unmade, indicating an abrupt departure. Personal belongings and provisions were found in their usual places, raising perplexing questions about why the men would leave without proper gear or supplies. These were experienced lighthouse keepers after all. The message that Captain Harvey telegrammed back to the mainland mentions that the clocks were stopped and other signs indicated that the accident must have happened about a week ago. So it's difficult to know for sure exactly when they disappeared. When the news reached the mainland, theories about the disappearance quickly began appearing. A more accepted theory is that illness or insanity might have driven the keepers to irrational behavior leading to their disappearance. On the other hand, there is no historical record or evidence suggesting that any of the keepers had a history of mental health issues. Typically, individuals with pre-existing mental health conditions might exhibit signs or symptoms prior to a significant event. Additionally, the keepers left personal belongings, such as waterproof coats and other items, in their usual places. This suggests a sudden and unplanned departure rather than a gradual breakdown of sanity. There was also no evidence of foul play or violence found anywhere on the island. Due to this contradictory evidence, 
no conclusions based on the presumption of insanity or a normal mental state can be made. If the keepers didn't vanish due to insanity, then what else could have happened? Aileen Moore is situated in the Outer Hebrides, an area known for its rough seas. The island's topography makes it susceptible to large waves, and the keeper's location on a rocky outcrop could expose them to the force of the sea. Evidence which suggests this was the lack of bodies, and the only explanation for the missing bodies on a small island out in the ocean is that they must have ended up in said ocean. However, as stated earlier, no waves could be large enough to wash these men off the island if they were situated high above the water in the lighthouse, which is exactly where experienced keepers would be in a storm that could produce such waves. Being taken by a wave would also contradict the most important aspects of this case, the evidence. The keepers simply wouldn't have gone outside without their coats during a storm, so why were they left behind? Also, remember that the lighthouse was 45 meters above sea level, which is far taller than the largest waves that occur in that region, usually having a height of five and a half meters at most, essentially concluding that it couldn't have been a wave. However, one crucial piece of knowledge has so far been excluded from all of these theories. These explanations were conceived in a time before we understood a phenomenon called rogue waves. Rogue waves, also known as freak waves or monster waves, are exceptionally large and unexpected ocean waves that deviate significantly from the surrounding wave patterns. These waves are characterized by their extreme height, rapid steepness, and unpredictability making them a formidable and sometimes fatal phenomenon at sea. Rogue waves were only officially recognized nearly a century later in 1995, when a rogue wave with a significant height of about 25 meters struck the Dropna platform in the North Sea. One of the largest rogue waves ever reported occurred between Iceland and the United Kingdom in 2002. The significant wave height during this event was an astounding height of 30 meters. However, whilst a wave of this size might not be large enough to pose a significant threat to the keepers inside their lighthouse, this is only the largest recorded rogue wave in the area. Due to these big waves being very newly discovered, we don't have that much measured data, so it's commonly accepted that rogue waves could theoretically be much, much bigger. The chances of one occurring are extremely low, but the possibility of a wave exceeding 45 meters hasn't been ruled out. If this idea seems like it's reaching a bit, then consider this. After the incident, Moore and three volunteer sailors were left on the island to attend the light for the time being. The men searched every part of the island for evidence regarding what happened to the keepers. They found that whilst everything was intact on the east landing, the west landing had suffered significant damage, presumed to be caused by storms. Also consider the fact that a box which was situated 33 meters above the water had been broken by something forceful, and the nearby iron railings had been bent over. The iron railing by the path was hit by something so hard that it had been wrenched out of its concrete foundation, and a rock weighing over one ton had been displaced. Even higher up than that, the men found that over 60 meters above sea level, at the top of a cliff, turf as far as 10 meters from the cliff edge had been violently ripped away. The only thing we truly know about the fate of the three lighthouse keepers is that they were never seen again. People disappear quite often. In fact, according to the National Missing and Unidentified Persons database, in the US alone, more than 600,000 people are reported missing each year. However, only roughly 22,000 missing reports are still unsolved, which is a tiny fraction of the total missing reports ever submitted. Even then, lots of these cases have evidence which heavily supports an explanation but isn't quite enough to be used as a conclusion in court. These statistics show just how rare these cases where little to no evidence is left behind truly are. And that is why they are so intriguing. Thank you so much for making it this far into the video. I wanted to say that the support my channel has been getting recently has been truly mind-blowing. Every day I check my phone and see many comments saying such lovely things about my content. I hope you enjoy it enough to consider subscribing so that you can join me on this journey. If you enjoyed this video, a like would be greatly appreciated. And I do read every comment, so if you've got some feedback then please leave a comment down below. And as always, take care now.